following work is brought to you by Scrib Crib. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon for more information on our works. And as always, if you want to know more about what we're doing and be up to date when we release it, always like and subscribe. Victor and Christy walked down the hallway and out of Poe headquarters, eventually leading out into the streets of the city. People were still out and acting as if nothing had happened, but Victor knew it was only a matter of time before the curfew was ordered. How long until you think the captain panics and shuts down the city? asked Victor curiously. Christy smirked and shrugged with a gentle sigh. It's hard to say, but that order has to be given from those who are a bit higher up in the command chain. Christy glanced over at people who were rummaging through trash bins, merchants who were shouting at one another, and pedestrians trying to cross the street without being struck by oncoming traffic. This experiment is only 12 years old. The last thing they're going to want to do is instill a panic and potentially disrupt everything they've built. Victor sighed as he watched life continuing as if nothing had happened. If any of these citizens saw what I saw, they'd be in their domiciles and barricading themselves in. Their lives will continue unabated as Poe hunts and eventually captures that murderer, affirmed Christy confidently. She smiled warmly and shook her head, making her auburn hair shimmer in the neon lights that surrounded them. But there is something much more pressing that matters, Victor. Victor turned back and locked his eyes on Christie's. And what's that? He inquired. You know what I'm about to ask. She replied harshly, prompting Victor to hang his head and sigh. Come on, Victor. Let's just go get this over with. Fine. Come on, he said while motioning for the scientist to follow him. My apartment is a wreck, though. It always is, Victor, Christy retorted. Victor's apartment was small and minimalistic. The common area had a small television that was hardwired into the Poe feed, allowing him to see briefs as they came in. The kitchen was barely functional, though he primarily ate most of his meals at headquarters, and what he did eat at his home were already prepared rations. The bedroom was off to the side with a bathroom beside it. The apartment was small, yet functional, just like most of the domiciles in Soda City and Eden. However, scattered about were random garments and trash. It wasn't remarkably clean, though in fairness to Victor, he was only there when he slept. Christy closed her eyes and composed herself. The sight of the mess in front of her gave her pause. All right, let me see, she announced, getting to the point of why she wanted to be away from the eyes of Poe. You going to buy me dinner first, joked Victor, prompting a quick eye roll from Christy. He reached down and grabbed the bottom of his shirt, pulling it off and tossing it onto the floor before turning around and exposing the circuits in his skin. Everything feels fine, Christy, I promise. Christy scoffed while leaning forward and examining each of the chips in Victor's back. I hear you, Victor, but is everything working properly? She asked rhetorically while prodding away at the various chips embedded in his back. Victor remained perfectly still while Christy examined him, just as she did regularly. Victor was special and lucky to be alive, and it was all thanks to Christy. The doctors and Poe were ready to leave Victor for dead after the building collapsed on him. However, while clinging to life and refusing to succumb to the crippling feeling of death, Christy stepped in. Without the scientists and doctors around, Christy performed a procedure that was taboo, implanting cybernetics to stabilize Victor's bones and muscles while also restoring functionality to all of his organs. It was a long process that took several days, all of which Christy performed while outside of the watchful eyes of Poe. Cybernetics were not something that was readily accepted. However, Victor survived and was a strong soldier because of it. Christy was an outcast, though she was far too valuable to be fired or arrested. She was, however, discharged and sent to work in the labs instead of the medical facilities. Christy was no longer treating patients, but instead analyzing the dead. You're going to need to take a bit more care, Victor. These circuits are working, but I worry for how much longer. Victor smirked while keeping his eyes focused on the window in his domicile. Can we not replace it? Christy laughed and rose up from her knees. Where are we going to get a cybernetic chip in Soda City? Do you think they just sell a few at the bodega down the street? Victor smirked and walked toward the window, leaving Christy standing in the center of his apartment. Victor, there are two options, continued Christy. We can either try and repair the chips, which there are people in Soda City who can do that for a hefty fee. Victor hung his head and sighed. Or, he asked, already knowing the answer. Or we try and smuggle one in from the surface, answered Christy. Which would be easier, but it's very illegal. Victor raised his eyebrows and placed the palms of his hands on the small window. He glanced out at the street, just as he did earlier, and watched the citizens of Soda City scurry about as if nothing had happened, as if an outlander hadn't invaded and began slaughtering them. How did you get the chips the first time? Christy stared at the back of Victor with a blank expression. I told you not to worry about it, she said with a stoic gaze. The less you know, the less danger you're in. Victor shifted his head down slightly inside. You smuggled them in. I said don't worry about it, she said a bit more harshly. 
Victor let out a deep breath and turned around to face Christy. Fine. We'll try to repair the chips for now, but if it's not enough, we'll have to smuggle one in. Christy nodded, satisfied with Victor's decision. I really wish you'd tell me where these chips came from, though, he inserted to Christy's dismay. Whenever I take off my shirt and the others in the locker room see me, they ask questions. They look at me like I'm some hyper-programmed freak. I've heard rumors that they think I'm in league with the Syndicate, and we all know that's not the case. I've put too many of them in the jails of Soda City to be on the same team. Christy rolled her eyes again, something that Victor was used to seeing. And what happens when they see you in action? Victor scoffed before a legitimate smile emerged from the corners of his mouth. They're glad I'm on their side. Christy reached forward and patted Victor on the shoulder. Then stop worrying about where I found the technology and embrace the fact that you have it. Victor noticed the tension in the room, seeing the fire in Christy's eyes matching her hair. So why don't you tell me a little bit about that theory you had back in the vault instead? Asked Victor, trying his best to change the subject away from the cybernetics that saved his life, and instead, onto what Christy was pondering. She was brilliant, something that Victor appreciated. He always felt that Christy would think of the things that no one else would. When a problem would arise, she would allow her mind to ponder something that no one else would consider, and in many instances, she would offer the best solutions. Christy scoffed and walked over to Victor's kitchen. She reached into the cupboard and pulled out a small cup. She inspected it for any residue or filth before running it under the faucet, filling it up with water before taking a sip. Ever since I got moved to pathology, I've been tasked with the most mundane of tasks. Every few months, I have to go through the logs to see who is still in the vault, and if there are any leads on who they are. A few weeks ago, I did just that. I cataloged and inspected all of the cabinets. Every time I come to that cabinet, I always wonder what that thing is. I wonder if it's human. I wonder if it's sentient. I wonder if it's just some sick joke someone decided to play. She paused and took a sip from the glass, pretending it was clean while sipping the water. Checking it was a hunch, nothing more. But I think there might be something to it. I think there might be something more. You said there was a match in the vault, inserted Victor, watching closely as Christie's mind continued to center on the issue. He could tell there was more on her mind than she was letting on. He knew there was something more. I did, and I still think about it, what it could mean, because that thing in the cabinet hasn't slaughtered hundreds of people, clarified Christy as she set the glass down in the sink. We have a probable corpse in a morgue cabinet that has been there undisturbed for 12 years. We have some outlander, some crazed assassin who is well-trained with an insatiable bloodlust rampaging through Soda City that just so happens to mirror the DNA of that thing in the cabinet. Victor smirked and walked into the kitchen area, stepping past a small table to lean against the counter beside Christy. And I was able to make him bleed. Christy laughed harshly, prompting Victor to sigh. He murdered hundreds of people, many of them well-trained post soldiers, and you just so happened to land a punch. She turned away from Victor to fill up the glass again. You made him bleed. Congratulations, Victor. He still managed to get away basically unscathed, and if I had to guess, he's probably already out killing again. Assuming we don't have eyes on him, inserted Victor again, trying his best to talk down the potential of the Outlander. Christy set the glass down again and turned to face Victor. And what good would that do, Victor? He murdered several post soldiers already, some of them elite men and women who have served since the foundation of Soda City. What good would having eyes on him be other than providing an audience? Victor remained silent. Christy's words stinged and unfortunately made sense. Victor was the only member of Poe who was able to damage the Outlander, and he was in his apartment with Christy. As he stared at her for a few awkward moments, the television against the wall flipped on and immediately shifted to the emergency channel. Victor and Christy both turned toward it immediately, hearing the voice of Captain Lewis Preo's voice come through. Christy's skin crawled as she sighed heavily. She hated how Lewis Preo treated her, less like a doctor and more like a pariah. All soldiers, recruits, and officers, I need you to report to the command center and prepare to engage the Outlander. We have eyes on him in the H Quadrant and believe he is cornered, announced Preo, with both Victor and Christy looking on intently. This Outlander is very dangerous and he should only be approached by a full squadron of post soldiers. Do not engage on your own. Do not be a hero. All soldiers, recruits, and officers, report to the command center and prepare to engage as one. Victor took in a long, deep breath as Christy shook her head in disbelief. The young doctor turned around and walked toward the door of Victor's apartment. He's going to send countless soldiers to slaughter. Victor raised his eyebrows and released the deep breath. What other choice does he have? He asked rhetorically. Christy turned around, aghast at Victor's remarks. Christy, he either sends us to subdue him or the Outlander slaughters more innocent civilians. We chose this life. We chose to serve and we know the risks. Victor paused and composed himself with Christy nodding slowly, understanding what Victor was saying but still upset to hear it. 
We have a job to do, Christy, and we have to stop this man. Hey, the next part's coming again in about 30 seconds, but if you're enjoying this and you like some more of our stuff, check out By Gods and Kings, Nathair, Ascension. Follow the story of one of the antagonists of By Gods and Kings, Nathair Mertrand. As the middle child of five, Nathair was never poised for greatness. It would never be given to him, nor would it be offered. With two of his brothers priests to different gods, another a promising blacksmith with a hot temper, and his eldest brother, a power-hungry narcissist, Nathair was forced to forge a path in the world. However, once he was able to make something of himself, would his family allow it, or try to take what he earned? Nathair Ascension is available on Amazon, and also on the By Gods and Kings Spotify channel, as well as the Scrib Crib Publishing YouTube channel. Now, back to our work. Karaki awoke with a sharp inhale, the familiar scent of freshly brewed coffee filling her nostrils. Her ice-blue cybernetic eyes flickered to life, casting a soft glow on the dimly lit room. As she rose from her bed, the sleek black hair that cascaded down her back shimmered in the faint light. She couldn't help but smile, knowing that Abel had brewed the coffee as a gentle morning nudge for her and their brother Earl. Abel, she called out appreciatively, you'd never fail to rouse the dead. Only because the dead would miss my coffee. Abel's voice floated from the common area, warm and teasing like the steam rising from the hot liquid. Karaki stretched her limbs beneath the thin, metallic blanket, feeling the gentle hum of her cybernetic chips resonating throughout her body. The blue glow from the chips on the small of her back and right shoulder blade bathed the room in a ghostly azure light, casting eerie shadows on the concrete walls. She swung her legs over the edge of the bed, her feet finding solace on the cold floor as she gathered her thoughts for the day ahead. She rose gracefully, muscles flexing with the ease of a well-oiled machine, and approached a small data pad mounted on the wall. Placing her hand on its surface, she felt the familiar tingling sensation as it scanned her chips for any sign of malfunction or degradation. The screen flashed green, displaying a message, chips operating at full strength, no maintenance required. Another day, another battle, Karaki muttered under her breath, grateful for the reliability of her enhancement, but acutely aware of the constant threat they faced from Poe forces. Stepping out of her room, she found Abel sipping coffee in the common area, his brown eyes reflecting the dim light from the suspended lamps overhead. His gaze met hers, and he raised his cup in silent greeting. Your brew is our lifeline, she said as she entered the common area, her gaze landing on Abel. His curly brown hair was unkempt, and his warm brown eyes sparkled with amusement. Or at least, it keeps Earl from crushing skulls before noon. He quipped, taking a sip from his coffee. Speaking of Earl, where is our hibernating bear? Karaki asked, pouring herself a cup and feeling the hot ceramic against her fingers. Still unconscious, Abel replied, nodding toward Earl's closed door, but I suspect the scent will draw him out soon enough. Karaki chuckled, picturing her towering brother stumbling out of his room, bleary-eyed and disoriented, yet fully prepared to face the harsh world that was now Earth. She took a sip of coffee, savoring the bitter taste in her tongue and appreciating the warmth that spread through her body. Abel, she mused, her gaze drifting back to her brother, do you ever wonder if our reliance on these enhancements would be our undoing? His eyes flickered with concern as he considered her question. Sometimes, Karaki, but we need every advantage we can get against Poe. As long as we don't lose ourselves in the process, we'll stand a better chance at survival. Survival at any cost, she pondered, her thoughts turning to the consequences of their cybernetic enhancements. Perhaps, Abel conceded, but we won't forget who we are. We're still human after all, especially me, he continued referencing that unlike his siblings, he did not possess any cybernetic alterations. Speaking of, Karaki, how are your chips holding up? Despite Abel's lack of cybernetic enhancements, he always tried to understand and support his siblings' reliance on them, and he also made it a point to ensure they were always functioning properly. Full strength, she answered, a touch of pride in her voice. No maintenance needed yet. Good, Abel said, nodding as he took another sip from his coffee. We need you at your best if we're going to survive this war. You know we'd be lost without you and your skills. Those eyes have been very useful. Karaki blushed, but also knew he was right. The ability to scout out enemies from hundreds of yards away was a remarkably powerful tool. Thanks, Abel, she said with a soft grin. I'm just glad that I'm able to keep all of you that I care about alive in this wasteland. Abel's eyes grew distant as he pondered the reality of their situation. You know, he mused, staring into his coffee. The moment Poe and its soldiers accept cybernetic implants as the norm is the moment they'll truly be a danger. He glanced up at Karaki, a hint of worry in his warm, brown eyes. While they may have superior suits and weaponry, they cannot compete with the strength that comes from our cybernetic enhancements. Karaki considered her brother's words, her fingers tracing the rim of her cup as images of battles past filled her thoughts. 
The power granted by their cybernetic implants had indeed given them an edge in this war against the oppressive regime, but it hadn't come without a cost. The lines between man and machine blurred with each new enhancement, leaving her to wonder what remained of their humanity. True enough, she agreed solemnly, taking another sip of her coffee, but we must always be mindful of the consequences that come with the advancements we make. There's a fine line we walk, Abel. Indeed, Abel conceded, his expression somber. The price of survival is often steep, and we must never forget that. At that moment, the sound of a heavy door creaking open interrupted their conversation. Uralt, the youngest of the three siblings, emerged from his room, rubbing sleep from his piercing green eyes. He stifled a yawn as he lumbered toward the common area. Morning, you two, he grumbled, his voice thick with exhaustion. As he reached the table, he spotted a steaming cup of coffee waiting for him. Grateful, he wrapped his hands around the mug, drawing comfort from its warmth. Morning, Earl, Karaki greeted, her gaze lingering on her brother's powerful frame. The cybernetic chips in his wrist and ankles had transformed him into a formidable fighter, yet she couldn't help but worry about the long-term effects of their enhancements. Ava was just talking about the risk we face with our reliance on cybernetics, she said, seeking to include Earl in their discussion, how it might affect us in the fight against Poe. Earl took a slow sip of his coffee, contemplating their words. There's always a risk, he acknowledged, his green eyes hardening. But we do what we must to survive and protect our people. We can't let fear hold us back. As the siblings mulled over the precarious balance of power between them and their enemies, the weight of the responsibilities bore down upon them like an unyielding storm. The consequences of their decisions loomed large, and they knew that, ultimately, survival would come at a price. But for now, they stood united, bound by loyalty and determination, willing to confront whatever challenges the future held. A sudden tap at the metal door interrupted their conversation before it could truly get going. Abel rose from his seat, his muscles tense as he prepared for any potential threat. As he opened the metal door, a syndicate courier appeared before them, breathless and urgent. Abel, Karaki, Uralt, the courier gasped. Mirdok has summoned you to his chambers immediately. Uralt grumbled loudly in response, his brow furrowing with annoyance. He wasn't one for unexpected interruptions to his routine. Meanwhile, Karaki took a final sip of her coffee, savoring the rich warmth that coursed through her body while she considered the implications of the summons. The three siblings gathered their belongings and made their way out of the domicile, leaving the comfort and safety of their shared space behind. As they entered Mirdok's chambers, a palpable tension pervaded the room. Several syndicate members stood around, their faces etched with concern. The seriousness of their expressions suggested that matters were more dire than they had anticipated. Mirdok, standing tall and resolute, greeted them with a nod. Abel, Karaki, Uralt, thank you for coming so quickly, Mirdok began, his gravelly voice betraying a hint of unease. We have received troubling information that requires immediate attention. Karaki couldn't help but notice the lines of worry etched into Mirdok's aged face. It was evident that whatever news he bore weighed heavily on him. She clenched her fists, her cybernetic eyes scanning the room for signs of strength and reassurance among her fellow comrades. Sir, Abel spoke up, his gaze steady and unwavering. What is it that you need us to do? Time is of the essence, Mirdok replied, urgency clear in his tone. We must prepare for a possible confrontation with Poe. Our survival and that of all those who reside within the crater depends on our actions today. The words hung heavily in the air as the room absorbed Mirdok's ominous proclamation. He had yet to delve into the details, but Karaki knew that Mirdok rarely spoke in hyperbole. The thought of facing their adversaries head on was daunting, but Karaki knew they had no choice. They would stand together against the looming threat, bound by loyalty and a shared determination to protect their home. Mirdok's voice, like the grinding of gears, cut through the tense silence. There are several Poe transports in the tunnels headed toward the crater, he warned, his deep-set eyes scanning the room as if to gauge the impact of his words. Karaki felt her heart clench in her chest, the weight of responsibility settling upon her shoulders. Prepare for defense, Mirdok continued, his tone unwavering. We need to be ready to repel their advance and ensure the citizens can evacuate. A murmur of disbelief rippled through the chamber as the syndicate members exchanged weary glances. They had faced skirmishes with Poe forces before, but never had the enemy ventured so close to their home. Every battle before either took place in Eden, the subterranean metropolises that they were all shunned from, or on the surface of the earth, being bathed by the harsh, deadly radiation. Unbelievable, muttered Abel, his hands tightening into fists. They've never come after a settlement before. What could they possibly want from us now? Who knows, Earl growled, his brow furrowed in frustration, but we won't let them take one step further than they already have. Karaki could feel the undercurrents of anxiety and determination coursing through the room, interweaving with her own resolve. 
Her mind raced, calculating defensive strategies and considering their limited resources. The lives of countless innocents rested in their hands, and the success of their endeavors hinged on their ability to work together and outmaneuver the encroaching threat. Perhaps they've grown desperate, suggested one of the syndicate members, her voice trembling slightly. With the advancements in our cybernetics, they must realize that we're becoming a force to be reckoned with. Or they're simply hungry for power and control, countered another, his jaw set in grim defiance. Whatever the reason, Karaki knew that the time for speculation was over. They needed to act and do so swiftly if they hoped to repel the invaders and protect their people. As she surveyed the room, taking in the faces of her comrades, she felt a surge of purposeful determination. Enough talk, Karaki declared, her voice ringing with authority as she locked eyes with Mirdok. We know what we must do. Let's prepare ourselves for the battle ahead. Agreed, Mirdok nodded, his expression tout with resolve. Let us stand united in our defense and prove to them that we will not be conquered so easily. Mirdok's deep-set eyes flickered with the weight of his next revelation. The room still buzzing from the recent discussion fell silent as he raised a hand for attention. Before you all leave, there is one more thing, Mirdok announced, his voice grave. All communication from Soda City has been disabled. A collective gasp echoed throughout the chamber, punctuated by murmurs of disbelief and concern. Karaki's heart tightened in her chest as she attempted to process the severity of the situation. She clenched her fists, the glowing blue chips embedded in her shoulder blade tingling with anticipation. Is it possible that the attack on the crater is connected to this? Asked Abel, his brow furrowing in worry. I cannot say for certain, but I cannot rule it out either, Mirdok admitted, stroking his thick, bushy beard as he pondered aloud. It's possible that Poe believes we, the Syndicate, are responsible for the communications blackout. Karaki's mind raced, trying to decipher the implications of such an accusation. If Poe believed they had taken out the communication, then any hope of avoiding conflict seemed to vanish like wisps of smoke. Then we must prepare for the worst, Uralt declared, his voice hoarse yet resolute. Indeed, Mirdok agreed, his tone laden with the burden of leadership. We have no choice but to defend our home and our people. We can only pray that the truth will surface before bloodshed becomes inevitable. With heavy hearts and steely determination, the Syndicate members began to file out of Mirdok's chambers, each lost in their own thoughts and fears. Karaki's boots echoed against the metal flooring, her pulse quickening at the prospect of the looming confrontation. As the Syndicate members dispersed, each focused on their respective tasks, Karaki couldn't help but feel the gravity of the situation pressing down upon her. Yet, amidst the fear and uncertainty, she knew one thing remained steadfast, their unwavering loyalty to one another in the crater. In these dark times, when the consequences of scientific experimentation had wrought chaos and destruction, it was this bond alone that would see them through the storm.